Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Shanna O'Toole. I am the founder of the Clause 40 Foundation, named after a part of the Magna Carta in which the promise of due process that America's legal system is based upon was first written down in the 13th century. The preamble of our constitution sets forth aspirations that our founding generation foresaw were necessary for the establishment of a free, just, and prosperous nation. In fact, the concept of justice was foremost on their minds. It's the first foundational principle listed in our preamble. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice. Yet the concept of justice is complicated. It has to balance individual liberty and fairness with public safety and victim restoration. Clause 40 Foundation is a nonpartisan 501c3 founded on the belief that the promise of justice in the preamble is still unfulfilled in our modern society. And that failure is preventing the advancement of this country and all of its people. We believe the erosion of procedural due process rights is one cornerstone of the problem. And therefore our mission is to rebalance the nation's criminal legal system by preserving the due process rights guaranteed in the constitution through public education, events, research, litigation, and advocacy. While other voices are shouting at each other across a void of misunderstandings and mistrust, we are working to bridge the divide, partnering with all communities to move America toward justice. I'm also the founder and president of the Due Process Institute, our sister organization, a 501c4 organization that lobbies to change the criminal laws and policies of this nation. Thank you for joining us for this evening for an advanced screening of the first episode of Philly DA, a new docu-series from Independent Lens and ITVS. For the next seven Sundays, except for Easter Sunday, which we are skipping, we will be presenting one episode followed by a panel of terrific experts to discuss the main topics that arose in that episode. We'll even be joined by Larry Krasner himself on our final episode on May 16th, two days before his primary. So we do hope you join us for more of these. And don't feel bad if you need to miss one, each episode stand on its own, stands on its own. So you don't absolutely have to have seen the last one in order to enjoy them. You can register for each of the remaining episodes by returning to our Eventbrite registration page or by visiting our website, clause40.org. Before I introduce my special guest this evening, I wanna share with you that the folks who are bringing you this docu-series would love to hear your thoughts about it. And if you provide an evaluation, you will also have the opportunity to hear from fellow viewers. You can join the conversation by clicking on the doc scale link that's in our chat box or by texting the word justice to 415-223 8013. I'll repeat that info at the end. And now let's meet my friends for this evening. And I call them my friends because they were willing to give up their Sunday evening to help us put on this event. So first, may I introduce Keir Bradford Gray. Since becoming Chief Defender of the Defender Association of Philadelphia in 2015, Keir has been the city's leading advocate for comprehensive justice system reform. She believes that the Defender must not only provide clients with first-rate legal counsel, but also champion innovative programs and partnerships that give communities the power to ensure positive outcomes for those who encounter our justice system. A Boston native, Kira has dedicated her career to public interest work. And sadly, we've all recently heard that you will be moving on from the office soon, but you have said that you're willing to share with our audience tonight what you'll be doing next. Why don't you tell us? Yes, so I am going to be joining the prestigious law firm of Montgomery McCracken Walker and Rhodes. And I am excited about the path that I'm gonna take over there. I'm gonna be able to do the things that I still hold near and dear to myself. And it really infused more public private partnerships that help produce equity in communities, especially in Philadelphia. So stay tuned. I'm not going anywhere just yet. <laughs> That's exciting. Next, I'd like to introduce Samuel Trevetti. He is a senior staff attorney in the Criminal Law Reform Project, working closely with the ACLU's Campaign for Smart Justice. So Mill is focused on prosecutorial and criminal law reform litigation, policy, and advocacy. His work integrates novel lawsuits and amicus briefs with legislative, advocacy, and voter education efforts to change incentives for law enforcement and reduce mass incarceration and racial disparities in the criminal justice system. And last, we are joined by Jessica Brand, founder and co-director of the Wren Collective. Previously, she served as the legal director at the Justice Collaborative, heading a team of attorneys, researchers, journalists, and media strategists that work to reduce the harm caused by the deeply flawed criminal justice system. In that job, she advised elected officials across the country as they tried to proactively implement meaningful change, 
while leading communication strategies to roll out policies to safely shrink incarceration levels and supervision in their jurisdiction. She is also a proud public defender service of DC alum, as is my husband, so go PDS. So thank you to all three of you for joining me tonight. Um, wanted to start the conversation, just throw it out to any and all of you to answer, what is a reform prosecutor or a progressive prosecutor? And how does that differ from any other kind of prosecutor? It's hard for, for me not to itch at that. <laughs> Great start. I started. Um, you know, I always said, I don't know what a progressive prosecutor is. But what I can say is that I appreciate a fair-minded and ethical prosecutor, one that definitely wants to be transparent, but also be honest and trustworthy in discharging their duties. So in terms of prosecution, their job is to prosecute, um, but they can do it with a better sense of balance and a better understanding of what it is they're actually trying to achieve. Because um, the prosecutors that I've seen in, in this role sometimes has a skewed vision of what justice means, of what justice looks like. It looks like how many cases have I won or what's my record versus how many people never came back in this system? How many people went on to, to thrive based on their entanglement in this system and, and, and coming out with the right uh, solution? So I just hope that when we talk about this conversation, it's in the greater context that there are three legs to this justice system and we've added a fourth, which is community voice. And all of those four systems need to work together to really achieve justice. Anybody else wanna take a crack? What is a reform prosecutor to you? Yeah, you know, I'll say that I, the term has undergone a lot of change in this little experiment that we've had over the last decade or so, and that's a good thing. Um, and I so, what I want the next iteration to be without defining the old iterations is someone, and this is a bit of a paradox, someone who leaves the office smaller and less powerful than when they got there, right? Which is hard because you're asking ambitious politicians to willfully devolve their own power. But that's what we need in this system right now. I think we all agree the system is too big and too painful and too punitive, right? So to me, going forward, um, a truly transformational prosecutor, pick another word, um, one that's not already worn out, right, and, and ground to dust, but a transformational prosecutor is one that's taking steps to reduce their own power. That can look a lot of different ways, right? But at the end of the day, you know, if Larry Krasner was being honest in this episode and says this is the last job he wants, I want him to shut down two floors on his way out the door. That would be truly transformational. Yeah, I, I think about it both sort of similarly, but also a little differently. I think one thing, one way to think about what is a progressive or transformational prosecutor is to think about what they are not. Um, and I think expectation setting is really, really important here. Um, progressive, transformational, whatever prosecutors, they're not abolitionists. They're still law enforcement officials. And I think that's part of how we've, this movement has sort of struggled with the term and the role. In the end, they will be putting people in jail and prison for a long time. Um, so, and I think that's an important anchor. But they are different than the old because they are willing to sort of undo the muscle memory that responds to every problem in society with jail and incarceration. And that muscle memory is so strong when you think about the criminal legal system and are willing to say, what are the practices we can get rid of right away that have only caused harm and that haven't caused any improvement to communities and to public safety? And there are a lot of those. And there are a lot of those that people across the country have gotten rid of in a lot of our cities. And they're willing to stand up against those, even in the face of enormous backlash um, for some very, very commonsensical, what we think of as minor reforms. Um, some of these people end up with their lives threatened by racists, by police unions. It's really remarkable. So I think of it as how do we undo some of the muscle memory and how do we actually think about shrinking the system? Whether or not they're going to shrink the power of their office, I don't know, it remains to be seen. But shrinking the size of the system and the harmful effects of that system has to be a hallmark of what these people do or I don't think they deserve any of that label. All right. So this first episode is shows, you know, a little bit of Larry's first campaign and then goes into some of his first days in the office. Here, you were there in Philly when Larry was running his campaign, right? 
Do Hello? you remember what the defense community thought about his chances of winning when he was campaigning? Was there any hope he'd make it? Or did people think it was a joke? Or were the defenders just so jaded about the system that no one really cared because someone was running on a campaign promise they were going to change things, but you know, you didn't believe it? What, what was the, the view on Larry from the defender community before he won? Well, the, the funny part is, is I was really at the forefront of this and I was in talks uh, about possibly making a run myself. Um, I had just become the chief defender and it was really something that was monumental to me. So I was not ready to leave, but I did recommend Larry's name to some pretty prestigious power players um, that had a, a lot of money to offer for advertisements. So I, I think we, I will tell you this, the people that I know, um, myself included, we embraced the idea of a new day and a new perspective in that role. There were people that thought that he wouldn't have a chance in hell to, to win because we weren't ready for that. But honestly, this is the part that I really want to stress. Philadelphia's community was ready. They were already formulating um, many movements around narratives and messaging and, and, and kind of capitulating in ways that I don't think people understood. They think that Larry just happened overnight, but no, Philly was moving in this direction, creating movements to want to do something different in this space, and they made it happen. Larry didn't win because of the political machine. He won because of the underground or the, the ground movement that happened. It, it was the people that brought, like I think Aramis Ayala said this, and she was so right in the film. It was the, the, the ground on up that created Larry. We were tired of the same old things and we knew uh, what was at stake. So I think that it was really embraced and it was a nail biter to say, let's see if this is really gonna happen, but it happened by landslide. All right, so this is a question to anybody who wants to answer or everyone. In the lead up to the election, the, the choice is really framed and presented to the public as if there are just two choices. There's safety. And then there's like whatever Larry represents, right? Is it a fair system to those who experience poverty? Is it a fair system to black and brown people? Like whatever that is, right? So it's safety versus that. And Larry's opponent goes to businesses and says, I just want to keep your business safe. I just want to keep your family safe. Someone else gets interviewed that says, well, Philly is a dangerous city and I want law and order because I, I, I want to feel safe. And to be honest, I have friends and family watching tonight who would likely say the same thing. I mean, they care about keeping their community safe. So is that really the choice that we're talking about here? Does this come down to a battle between safety or a better, fairer system? Well, I think safety is on the side of a better and fairer system. And that's where the demarcation is totally false. You know, it is like such an, to me, it's such an easy, lazy answer to say the way to keep us safe is to put more people in jail and prison. Because we know in the 90s, when we were at the height of our mandatory minimums and our long sentences, that homicides were just as high as in Philadelphia and across the country as they were now. And then we decided to decimate our cities. It's why Philadelphia is still one of the poorest cities in America. I was just walking around North Philadelphia and I couldn't believe that it was not better than when I was in college there because we've divested from cities for so long and we've taken away the money from things that we actually know make cities safe. And instead we've poured them into a criminal justice system when all of those solutions are totally um, ineffective. And so when we actually talk about safety, you can only say, policing and more prosecution makes us safe if you're being lazy and dishonest. And actually it should come on the side of, we shrink the system and we build up supports for our community. And that's when people I think are just lying to the public. Yeah, I, I wanna be safer too. I don't wanna have to worry about my community, but the thing that's not making me safer is feeling like seeing the police you know, across the street, looking at the house across the street with a uh, you know, flashlight like I saw last week, that made me feel scared because I thought, well, that's where the money's going into and what's happening to my neighborhood. And so I think actually that is the choice, just safety belongs on the other side of the ledger than what people are saying. I think a, a corollary point here too, is that um, we allow public safety be, to be defined so narrowly so as to exclude public health 
and prosperity and things of that nature, right? And you don't need to go any farther than COVID to see, you know, sheriffs and other law enforcement um, refusing to wear a mask, right? A out of some sort of culture war. How much can they possibly care about your safety if they're not willing to protect you from a pandemic, right? Um, and so I think we have, we have allowed, and, and part of it falls on us, we have allowed the narrative around safety to be so narrowly circumscribed as to the imaginary guy hiding in the bushes, right? Whereas um, health and, and public safety and public health are so much more broad a concept. And when you broaden the concept, you do realize exactly what Jessica's saying, that reformers are the ones who in fact care about your health and safety a lot more because they're willing to reinvest in those things that actually make us healthier and happier. And Shanna, can I Oh, you're on in terms of the systems approach, um, we had really started to dig in deep with the, to the data uh, in terms of what practices and policies actually promote public safety or what practices and policies in our system make people more desperate. And so when you think about it from that point of view, are we making people more desperate by our blind practices that do not advance public safety, but actually keep people embedded in poverty and cyclical of uh, 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 connection with the justice system, that alone is something that's dysfunctional and something that is really unproductive. So we have really at our office tried to use data to show how many bail practices that we had that w made people more desperate. They, they came in with, with jobs and because they sat in jail on low level bail and maybe they ultimately got a dismissal or even probation, right? Because some of the cases that they sit in jail for don't even warrant jail time. Um, how much better off did we make them in the neighborhoods that they're returning back to? So that does not, unharm, harmful justice policies does not promote public safety. In fact, it inhibits it. it, inhibits it. So Jessica, your organization is involved with supporting Larry Krasner's reelection campaign. Why is seeing reform prosecutors elected part of your organization's work? Sorry, I'm muting to avoid the barking dog when possible. Um, much to my chagrin as a public defender, I think it works. Um, I don't think it's an, like the only answer. I want to be clear. Um, the criminal justice system is an ecosystem. You need better judges. You need better policing. You need better mayors. You need, in places that aren't like Philadelphia, you need stronger public defenders um, who have more resources. You need all of those things. But um, prosecutors have power. They have so much power to do so much harm. And I think you can see real data effects for how systems have shrunk. And that is not unilaterally because of prosecutors, it's because people are working together in the system, but it, that is a, certainly a very important piece of it. Um, because you would not have a shrinking jail population without the defender, but you also wouldn't have it without a prosecutor who at least is willing to make arguments for certain types of cases or supervision years. Those things really matter. Um, you know, I was a capital, I was a capital trial consultant in Texas for a long time. And Philadelphia might as well have been Texas in terms of how they used the death penalty. I mean, it's just atrocious. The cases with people with 60 IQs. So many pe innocent people who have been taken off death row in Philadelphia, and that, that can end. And that is the prosecutor. I mean, they don't need partners to make that happen in most places. They can just do that themselves. And so I think um, it really matters to real people's lives. And yes, I think we make a mistake when we act like they are the only actor in the justice system, but they are an important actor and anybody who has worked in the trenches knows that and has felt that to their core. Um, they've watched people really be harmed that you know we deeply care about. And I would have loved for someone like Larry to be negotiating against me as opposed to the US attorneys that we were dealing with when I was in the district, so. Understood. So Kier, how much of a difference has it actually made having a reform prosecutor in the role, what's been better and what's been the same? That's a great question. And I, I really, look, I do think that we welcome uh, open-minded prosecutors. We welcome prosecutors that are not just 
you know, punitive in nature because that actually fits with our notion of justice. But I can tell you, um, you know, for my office, we still have some of the very similar battles in the courtrooms um, against, you know, assistant district attorneys. We still are bucking against some of the same uh, natural understanding or knee jerk reaction to behaviors done by communities of color because sometimes we just can't see what the alternatives are or be creative or more creative or bold to say, we're not going to do this anymore. And I'm not saying that Larry hasn't said we're not gonna do that in some areas, but we still see a whole lot of disproportionality um, coming in because it's hard to understand who people are if we don't build in a mechanism to have more humanity so that unbiased decision-making can go on. Um, right now, our system is structured in such a way that even when, even when there are times to make decisions, there's not the information, the investigation, or the fact-based um, uh, decision-making that I would like to see. So the reform prosecuted, what, what's been good about Larry is that I've had a partner discussing these issues uh, broadly from that side and our side, validating them in terms of what we should be doing. Um, and that's, that's really good because he's got a, a pulpit that no one else in the system has. Um, the, all, the other good thing about Larry is that for me, I can actually reach out and talk to him about specific things that I could not do uh, with the former DA. I was here when Seth Williams was uh, the DA and I didn't have the opportunities to have conversations with, D, with DA Williams that I do with, with Larry Krasner. That is a great thing. But for this system to truly work in the equitable fashion that we need, we're gonna need much more than just a progressive DA and a, a daggone good public defender. We're gonna need a real structural change that allows us to uh, like, and I've, I've always been a fan of shrinking the system, uh, but limit contact, have alternative approaches to addressing behavior and really do a real racial bias, I guess I would say um, audit on our system to understand why we're bringing in people uh, for certain behaviors in one community that we wouldn't think about bringing them in uh, for those same behaviors in other communities. Excellent. So I know, so it looks like Jessica is getting distracted, but I'm gonna let her know that the question's coming for her. Um, That's we, plugging in my computer. Which we, see that, we see this episode that is, as soon as Larry walks in the door, he starts facing some obstacles and some resistance internally, right? Um, Kira was just talking about how maybe at the assistant DA level, maybe there's less change than you think. And of course, that's not a surprise, right? We see that some of them are incredibly resistant to their boss's efforts at culture change. So I'm sure he's not the only reform prosecutor who is facing those kind of internal obstacles. <laughs> what, can be, what can be done to address some of those so that a more progressive prosecutor's policies can in fact have the intended consequences that they're meant to have. Yeah, that's the million. It's a great question. And it's the hardest question, I think. I think um, myself included, I think when we sort of started this movement and elected progressive prosecutors, there was this idea that like with one stroke of a pen, you could be like, okay, we're going to end excessive sentencing and long probationary sentences and when it would just happen. And it's like, oh, right. These people are taking over in some places snake pits. Um, where there's just been decades of corruption that's allowed. I mean, when you look at the civil asset forfeiture practices that were coming out of this office, you know, people were like riding around on stolen cars. I mean, it, you know, that takes some time. So what can we do? One is I think it's really important to recognize that these offices are going to take some time to flip. And that's a really hard thing to stomach because people's lives are at stake right now. And so, you know, you, especially when you're someone in Kier's place and you're advocating on behalf of clients, it's like, we, we were promised change and you want it now. And there's some kind of balance that is just, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, some of it is recruiting. Um, you know, I actually think Larry has done a nice job of this. He's, you know, been recruiting all over the country to replace line prosecutors. He spent a lot of time at HBCUs. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but building up a different kind of line ADAs is important and takes time. And I think the third thing, when we think about policy work, how do you implement policies? We've so, for so long thought about you know, well, prosecutors have all this discretion. In my view, I'm not saying this is the view of any of any particular prosecutor, 
we can't, you should not have a lot of discretion given to your line ADAs and your policies at first, because any, then you will have a truck driven through your policies. And I'm sure here see some of that in practice. Um, you know, if you're not going to get on board with presuming release or asking for no more than six months on a misdemeanor for probationary sentences, then this may not be the place for you. And I think having really restrict, strict policies is important for that. This gets much harder in offices where the prosecutor can't fire people. So like if you're watching Los Angeles right now, there's a revolt happening where George Gascon has taken over and that office is unionized. And so he has very, it's very hard to get rid of people who aren't on board. Wes Bell, when he took over in St. Louis, the office joined the police union as he was taking over his office right before he took it. And so that, I mean, then it's a whole different quagmire of how do you change culture within that structure? I think there are ways, but for the most part, that's not what prosecutors are dealing with. But I think recognizing that for a while you want to itty bitty the discretion up is really important. So this is for everybody. Oh, so sorry. in this episode, we hear a lot from the head of the Fraternal Order of Police who opposes Larry's election. And then even when Larry becomes DA, this man is making statements that makes it seem like he and his organization just will not be working with the DA's office so much as working against it, frankly. So for anybody and everybody, why is a reform prosecutor perceived as being an actual threat to the police? Well, I, I'll, I'll start here. I, I'm sure um, Kieran and Jessica have thoughts here as well, but um, it, it's because it's, it, it upsets the apple cart, right? And they've had, they've had undying fealty from the district attorney's office for so long. And prosecutors and police, even reform prosecutors and police, are, have, have an inescapable conflict of interest, right? Um, they rely on each other for their professional development. Right. Uh, until we stop measuring success in convictions, and that speaks to the culture change that Jessica talked about and, and Kira has talked about, until we stop measuring success of the law enforcement community by convictions and crime rates, um, they are always going to have that intractable conflict of interest. Um, and so when the police union, and by the way, let me just say, if I didn't know this was a documentary, like I would have thought that McNesby was too cartoonish to be real, right? Like, I mean, whew, that guy. So, uh, but but he, I, I'm told he is real. Um, so so you know, uh, I think I think um, their relationship has been so deep seated, and one covers for the other, and vice versa, so openly and brazenly, right, for so long that when you have a when you have a, a reformer who actually wants to hold police accountable for the first time in literally hundreds of years, of course, they're going to see that as, as a threat. It is a threat. It ought to be a threat. Police ought to feel a little more threatened by the possibility of criminal investigation or investigation of any kind, um, because we all know that police uh, have a long history of, of, of committing crimes on the way to, uh, you know, allegedly solving them. So that's the problem. I, I would add to that. You know, Larry wasn't just a defense attorney. He was also a civil rights attorney that sued police uh, time and time again in Philadelphia. So he was very well known by the police department, especially uh, McNesby, who, you know, he wasn't the FOP um, leader at the time that Larry was suing cops. He was actually a cop. Um, <laughs> what's so funny, we, we had a, a list that we, he was part of what we call the dropsy cops. Um, and that was everyone who, uh, you know, they arrested automatically dropped their drugs every time they came up on the scene. And so, you know, McNesby was one of the dropsy cops for when I was practicing as a young lawyer. But, you know, so everything that Samuel said, and plus the fact that Larry sued police departments, got all of the information about police that, you know, they want tucked away and that the city solicitor's office fights defense lawyers get, uh, to get, Larry had that. So he knew where the bodies were buried you know, pun intended. Um, he knew where all those things were and they knew he was going to take that and use it so, so as not to bolster the bad behaviors. And um, I think he came out with a bit, pretty strong statement in the very beginning when he released the police do not call list. That was a big transparent deal. And I will tell you, if anything I'm most proud of 
uh, being in the city with a prosecutor that's in the progressive stance and the progressive world. It is the transparency and the decency to say people deserve fair trials. And these officers have exhibited character issues or challenges and credibility challenges. And if they were the only ones that testified against people who are supposed to get due process, then they need a new trial. And these things that these officers have been accused of should be turned over to the defense so that they can use it uh, the way that most people would think that the justice system should work. Uh, that means both, both parties have full transparency on both sides. So I, I will say, I can't say enough about that part of what prosecutors can do because that's keeping the system honest. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, the scope of resistance um, from the FOP Lodge 5 in Philadelphia to any form of criticism is like just absolutely remarkable. And I think, you know, Samuel and Kira, right, you didn't see it. And then all of a sudden people started seeing it and it's like, no, the rest of us all take criticisms in our lives. And for some reason, the police union thinks that they're immune to them. And I, you know, it's not just Larry. I mean, my favorite story of the last few years about that is, you know, the Eagles, and here's a little acquaintance with him, Malcolm Jenkins wrote an op-ed that said, like, this is what we need for people to feel safe in this city. And one of them was more accountability and police union contracts. It's very, okay, transparency, you know, you should be able to fire someone who's caused a lot of harm, not very controversial. And McNesby went ballistic and called him like a washed up football player, um, which led to McNesby's picture and Malcolm Jenkins' picture on the front of the paper side by side, which was pretty hilarious. I mean, that guy took every snap for the Philadelphia Eagles the year they won the Super Bowl and the year afterwards and was a hometown hero. And yet that simple thing, you know, amount of criticism just set off just a flurry of battles. So when you have someone like Larry, who has sued the police 75 or whatever times, takes over and releases a do not call list, and, you know, prosecutes police officers, God forbid, who are accused of sexually assaulting women who work on the police force, you're just, that's where all the energy is going to go. Um, because yeah. if you can't even take one line in an op-ed from a football player, you definitely can't take it from the prosecutor. And so expanding this out a bit to beyond Philadelphia, Samuel, I feel like you've done a lot of writing about this. Talk to us a little bit more about sort of what, you know, what the role of prosecutors should be towards police. You know, you talked about how like, they're kind of viewed as being on the same team when really they shouldn't be. What, how, how else could it be structured? How should it be structured? Yeah, it, it's, it's a good question. And it, you know, it speaks to the sort of ecosystem that others have talked about, right? Um, and so it, I don't think that there is a way to restructure law enforcement to eliminate the conflict of interest. I think you have to have much better accountability and guardrails around it to reduce it as much as possible and make it as transparent as possible, right? So do not call lists are an excellent um, innovation. And if I can do the presidential debate thing where I hop back to a previous question, um, you know, Jessica mentioned how we need policy change internally. Well. I don't wanna stop there. I'm sure she would agree. We need legislation so that the next person who comes in can't just flip the policies back, right? And that we, we need legislation mandating do not call lists so that it's not up to every individual prosecutor who holds the office, whether they're going to hold police accountable and, and stand up for fair trials. That is, that is a requirement, forget of the constitution, it is, but it ought to be legislatively required. So, and that, and. Things like that can also rein in discretion, right? We can't just rely on every new prosecutor to say, I'm not going to prosecute marijuana. We need to take that criminal statute off the books and take away their discretion to ever do it again, right? Cash bail, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and with respect to the police, I think that's the most important. So, you know, one, one more concrete example, and then I'll shut up. But whenever there is a police-involved shooting, right, which by itself is a an awful term that we shouldn't use anymore, right? Whenever a police officer kills somebody um, in the line of duty, um, we, we have this debate about whether it ought to be the local prosecutor to prosecute or some other prosecutor. Um, to me, that's the wrong question. I, I, don't, I don't think that we can rely on anybody in the relevant jurisdiction who is a prosecutor to clear-eyedly prosecute a police officer for what they've done. They ought to be bringing me in or Jessica in to come and do that investigation. Truly, <laughs> um, someone truly independent and who knows how to investigate cops, right? 
Um, and so I think a lot of this boils down to understanding where intractable conflicts are and legislating them to death. So, yeah, go ahead. You know what? I, I honestly, I, I love everything that Samil said, but I would just say this one thing. Uh, prosecutors should be able to prosecute anyone who breaks the law, period. And I know that it should be, it, it's hard, but quite frankly, that's what we rely on them for. And in, when they show us that they cannot do that, they should no longer be able to be in that seat. I mean, why do you say that they, you don't think that they can? I mean, what, what is the conflict? Just, uh, just for some of our viewers who might be less experienced with the criminal justice system, tell, tell us what it is. Sure, sure. So, so there, there's the sort of formal relationship they have, right? Where prosecutors rely on the police to go out and arrest people and bring them their cases, right? Prosecutors rely on the police to come testify in their cases and police rely on the prosecutors to get those convictions to make their numbers look better, right? So that's just, that's just the way the system works and it'll likely never not work that way, right? I mean, we're all working to shrink that system, but the, at, the, at its core, we're probably going to have, you know, as law and order tells us, the police arrest people and the prosecutors take them to trial, right? That's just going to be how it works. Um, but I think maybe even more pernicious and intractable is their informal, like, social relationship, right? Prosecutors go to happy hour at the FOP lodge, right? They, they know each other's families. They know each other's kids. And they ought to. They're coworkers, Right. But um, it, that makes it maybe even harder to turn around and try to hold somebody accountable who you just went to a barbecue and had beers with the night before, right? And so that's why you need like truly independent human beings um, to come in and see things with clear eyes. Kira, you wanna res respond? <laughs> no, I, I, I agree with his reasonings. I'm just saying um, that I, I don't think that this is, something we should draw a line in the sand on. It is their responsibility. Yeah, Just sure. like everyone else in the system or, or who has friendships and relationships, when that friend does something that's violative of the law, uh, we can't just cover it up because we like the person. Um, and, and that's the oath that the prosecutor takes. So I expect every prosecutor, when they're looking at uh, what uh, a shooting where a police officer shot someone um, that was outside of the realm of his duties and it was criminal in nature to put that person on the stand and, and, and I mean, put that person through the test of, of the justice system. It, it has to happen that way. And I don't give anyone a pass for not doing it. Whether you're, you've had drinks the night before or had shared a Christmas gift or, or, or pie, uh, to me, that's inconsequential. Your job is your job and your duties are your duties. I've never seen a police officer say that I couldn't arrest a, a, a person that they, they, other than maybe another cop, but a person that they held near and dear when it was plastered on the news that this person actually broke the law. Police are going to get that person, whether they like them or not. And so I do is, expect prosecutors to do the same thing. Yeah, and, and I would agree that this is not it, a... I'm oh, sorry? Go ahead. Do we think prosecutors are doing it though? So I don't think prosecutors are, are doing it, I mean, not only because they're friends with some of the cops because it's not politically advantageous to them, you know? I mean, look, most of these prosecutors who are charged with the responsibility of prosecuting certain officers, they don't necessarily have a relationship with them. They're just, they just know that this is bad for their political career. The FOP is a very powerful political pack. And so when I, as a prosecutor, look at uh, Cameron, I'm sorry, uh, I'm, he, his name is escaping me, the Breonna Taylor's uh, uh, district attorney, I don't know if he knew the officers particularly, but he understands that that is not good for his career advancement. I also just want to add, I, I tend to fall on the side of Kira on this, I think. I mean, I, I think in, I, I understand the conflict. I think the conflict is big, but also prosecutors, yes, they have relationships with the police. They should also have relationships to the community and the, and the community that's impacted by police violence. And, and if they don't, and if they can't balance that, then voters should vote them out of office. Uh, and we've seen that happen. Um, you know, St. Louis is a great example of that. Um, and, and I think people voted Larry in part because he wasn't afraid of the police union and, the, you know, and taking them on. But there are policy ways that you can also mitigate those effects, right? There's a reason that some of these offices now have independent units 
to either exonerate, both exonerate people and to go after police officers who cause serious harm and prosecute those cases who don't handle other cases. Because when you're doing both, yes, you have just a real problem with a conflict of interest because you may want to be prosecuting the same officer who you think um, you also need to testify in your murder case. And that is a problem. But if you separate out and wall off those prosecutors, you can at least mitigate some of the conflicts that I think we see. I'm not saying that's a perfect solution. I really understand where Somil is coming from. New York took all of the police prosecutions out of the district attorney's offices and put them in the attorney general's office for, you know, for homicides caused by officers. And that makes, there is, I think, some logic to that, but there's probably an end to how you can do that. And we need these DAs to be accountable to the people. And part of being accountable to people is standing up to power. And those are law enforcement officers who cause harm. I'm going to put on my um, Due Process Institute president hat for a second and say that there might also be some procedural due process reforms that might address some of these situations where we're concerned whether prosecutors are really going doing their job when it comes to um, investigating whether and, and seeking, a, seeking a permission from a grand jury as to whether some a cop should be prosecuted for a killing. Um, I think of things like maybe having a transcript of the grand jury proceedings made that then becomes disclosed in those sorts of circumstances so that the public and everyone can see what was said, what happened at the grand jury after the decision has been made, right? There's the, the grand jury secrecy, there's no, there's no reason for it after that that reason, um, after, after it's, you know, all over. And, uh, you know, per, perhaps you might find that prosecutorial behavior inside the grand jury room change if they know that what they're saying and doing in those behind those closed doors is actually going to be disclosed to the public afterwards. Um, Love it. But the, but the, just an idea that the Due Process Institute is working on. So um, before we get to cash bail, which is important, I, 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 let's lighten it up a little bit and talk about our favorite moments. Um, my favorite moment is the first day when Larry's team is transitioning um, into the office. And one of them looks into the camera and says, um, it descri they describe it as if they were pirates climbing aboard a ship. And I just thought that, that I was really struck by that description. Um, there must have been so much dissonance for some of them. Many of them are longtime public defenders or criminologists, and they're, they're walking into a prosecutor's job for the first time. I, I know I, I couldn't do it. I've been on the defense side my entire life. I, I can't imagine what it would be like to become the prosecutor and have that first day. But um, I thought that was sort of an interesting description that they were like pirates raiding a ship. And um, so that was one of my favorite moments. And I have asked each of you to. Uh, tell our audience about your favorite moment and why. So I can go really quickly. I know we want to get to bail. Um, one of my favorite moments was watching the activist uh, portion of the, the film because that is what was happening in Philadelphia. The activists were very educated uh, about the issues and they were speaking out in support of uh, Larry Krasner, but also in support of the issues so that he had built a, a kind of a real ground swelling of support for, um, you know, doing things differently. And he, he was going to need that. So I, I, contextually, I want people to understand that Philadelphia was already there when Larry Kresner arrived. Samuel? Yeah, you know, we've talked about the FOP a bit, but mine was when um, what is seemingly a, a Beth Grossman ad with a man saying very smugly, she has the backing of the FOP and that's all you need to know. He turned out to be right and in the wrong direction, right? And I think that's a political dynamic that is extremely inspiring and will be relevant um, for this upcoming primary too, right? Who's gonna back the FOP and whether that's gonna be a good or bad thing? It's something to keep an eye out for. That's it. Yeah, mine is um, the moment when they show the debate and um, you know, a lot of people are using reformer language which has become very popular. And Larry says, like, this is what I've done for 35 years or 30 years. And to me, that's so important because we see this pop up all across the country and we are seeing it now, right? Um, you know, if you look at Larry's opponent's platforms, some of them are using reformer rhetoric and it's sort of like, well, you were in the DA's office for 35 years 
promoting horrible carceral policies. So what your your actions and your behavior has to at least have, there, there can't be that much daylight between them. Um, you know, Houston is another problem for I think this progressive prosecutor movement where the DA ran without a record, but on all of these promises to really change things and very little has changed in that county. And so the idea that, you know, we need to have some data and some information to really dig into that we, and, and a record of actually caring about people and people in the community before you get to have that mantle to me is really very important as we think about sort of the election side of the work. And actually, Samuel just wrote a piece in the Stanford Journal of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. And uh, you wrote, quote, as reform rhetoric becomes normalized and rewarded, voters must be increasingly wary of candidates and elected prosecutors merely paying lip service to change. I mean, this is the point that Jessica was just making. Tell us why you're worried about that. Like, how real is that worry? Um, first of all, thank you to you and my mom for being the only ones who read my Law Review article. I really it was a terrific um, piece. Yeah. Um, uh, I think, you know, Je Jessica just hit it on the head. Um, it is politically favorable now to say certain small, vague, <laughs> reformy like things um, in order to uh, get the money and attention that is going into these races, right? Um, but we haven't built, and, you know, again, I, I, I want to put the onus partly on us, we haven't built the accountability mechanisms to make sure that they follow through. Um, uh, and built a deep enough bench where a quasi reformer can be ousted by a real one, right? And so now that we're in this second wave of, of reformer elections, right? Everybody's gotten their first try. And those who have not shown results like Kim Ogg in Houston, um, uh, we, we need a, a better language and, and, and better metrics for showing exactly why um, she didn't live up to, to her words. Um, and so I think that's going to be the next challenge for us. You know, I just say, though, that I love the idea that two prosecutors are beating each other up yeah. at a podium, fighting over who can reform the system better, and that that is the conversation as opposed to how much tougher they can be, how many more bodies they can throw into the system and be ground up into, yeah. into me. And so, so uh, it's a, it's, for me, a good problem to have. We should in always fact, take a second and give ourselves a pat on the back for where we've come in ten yeah. Really, really. We yeah. Deserve Anna, it. We yeah. it was even, I mean, imagine the public defender being one of the moderators of, of those debates. So this was like, we were in la la land or, yeah. or, or space. <laughs> so it was a really good thing. Well, and, and what's interesting, so also all of us have been, you know, in, involved in criminal justice reform for probably over a decade, each of us. And so, you know, just quickly, does anybody have a good reason for why it, we actually, be, the movement was became so late to this idea of taking the revolution inside the walls? Because, you know, that's not a revolutionary idea in itself, right? That the reformers should go inside and become the system so in order to reform the system. Why was it so slow to alight in the criminal justice community? Because, you know, I think Larry has a friend in this film who's a criminal justice, um, a criminal defense lawyer who says something like, when Larry told me he was gonna run, I was like, you'll be the DA when David Duke runs the ACLU, right? You know, if, and, and you, any of us would have said the same thing five years ago. So why were we all so late to this idea of let's put reformers into these roles? Were we just so beaten down by the system? What, why, why did it take us so long to realize this, this might be a, a step forward? So I, I think it was really political will and, you know, resources to actually push that narrative out in the way that people needed to understand it. Um, what I saw, and I was involved in it uh, from 2012, I saw this reform effort come up when President Obama was in and he went to the jail um, making a huge statement uh, when he started talking about and using his platform, which was is the largest platform, about how we needed to have more sensible approaches. Then came Loretta Lynch uh, with her um, discussions. The political atmosphere and will became better. For, for this discussion, but then the resources to back people who actually had the, the backbone to jump in, um, you know, because there's not a lot of people that would say, are you crazy? You want me to go over there and do what I know needs to be done in this system? No way. So I'll give Larry a ton of credit and any other uh, prosecutor that was, you know, previously a defense attorney uh, turned prosecutor now, 
ton of credit. We call it taking one for the team because that was like something, well, it wasn't impossible. We knew that this was going to be a heavy lift and anyone had to fight internally and externally just to get things done. All right, so let's- I also let's, think, oh, sorry. I just wanna add, I think um, it's not just the DA's office. I think there's a renewed, a new focus on local elections and how important those are. And we just, as a country have spent so much time thinking about the power of your Senator or the power of the president, but that's not where the bread and butter is for criminal justice or for a lot of policy. Um, you know, city councils, it turns out are really important. If you care about policing, you better look at your mayor. And why we're slow to figuring out how important local government is, I don't know, but I don't think it's isolated to the district attorney. I think it's, um, it, I think it's all of election work. So let's uh, turn very quickly to the issue of cash bail, which comes up at the end of this episode. For those of you watching who might not know, obviously, you know, bail is something that is a person needs to come up with to pay in order to stay outside of the jail's walls while their case is pending. So it's in order to avoid pretrial detention, essentially. Um, so why do we think that cash bail was the first major reform idea that Larry um, took on? Why, why was it so important? Why did he tackle it first? Well, here might have an idea. Yes, cash bail was already being discussed before Larry got there. So I want to make that clear. Uh, we had a very great opportunity through the MacArthur uh, Safety and Justice Challenge Act to reform our prison population in which started with how do people come in? And so we came up with about 19 different strategic plans. One of them was to look at the way we infuse more information into uh, the decision to hold people or to release them. We also, they also came up with a risk assessment tool that we pushed back on strenuously because risk assessments, eh, I do not like those algorithms, um, extremely baked in bias. But this wasn't something that Larry just came up with. This was already in motion. How we, do, how we reform our bail system. We had talked about it before Larry got elected and sworn in. Um, he was in agreement with it and took it on when he came on as well. But it was already here. We were already doing the research and my office had already started putting structural pieces in place so that we can give mat bail magistrate judges alternatives, community alternatives to cash, to, to our cash bail systems and enlisting the ACLU uh, in some really much needed litigation um, with respect to our bail magistrate. So a lot of other things were happening and Larry was you know, a very welcomed uh, uh, you know, person to the party. <laughs> so we appreciated it. So someone in the film refers to cash bail as, the, as imprisonment for poverty, right? But what's the answer to people on the other side who say, well, bail is um, sort of a reasonable mechanism for ensuring that someone returns to the government, to the courts, pretrial services, in order to um, go, keep going with their case, that if you just let them out, maybe they won't come back and sort of deal with their charges. How does, how does someone respond to that? So, Amelia, you're shaking your head. Well, Jessica, do you want to take that one? I feel like this is... Yeah, I mean, it's a lie. I'm sure there's yeah. a nicer way to call it, but, you know, it's... There's re there's tons of research out there that says money bail has has no correlation to whether people come back to court. It has no correlation to whether people commit more crimes. You know, we can talk about pretrial detention, which no I think none of the panelists on this are big fans of. But that's really separate, that a separate conversation than what money bail actually does, which is just a poverty penalty that, you know, enlarges the pockets of bail bondsmen in this country. And it really is nothing more. And it's not like leftist, you know, anarchists making this up. There's tons of research papers out there. It's very, very clear, you know, and we have jurisdictions, the federal government, Washington, D.C., where, you know, your husband grew up practicing, where my husband and I grew up practicing, because apparently that's just where, you know, you meet your life partners. But, you know, we didn't have money bail and people came back to court, um, it, you know, in most of their cases. So it's just, it, it's a nice talking point that has no actual um, basis in fact. And Shanna, you gotta remember the types of bail that was what we were putting on people in Philadelphia. I mean, we were putting bail where they could not afford 250 to $500. If you are truly a danger, $250 to $500 is not going to be the metric by which someone says, hey, 
if that is, if, if this person's a danger, I'm only going to give them $250 to pay for bail. And remember, if you have access to money, you're out. So this has no bearing on a person's dangerousness or flight risk. It just has bearing on whether or not I have access or whether or not I'm going to sit in, in because there's no other creative options that my system will engage in to deal with whatever risk this person may, may possess, whatever that is. But so it's, it's really a farce and it's really a shortcut to dealing with some of our issues versus really kind of trying to figure it out and get it right on the front end. And I think, you know, although it seems crystal clear that it's wrong to use cash bail um, to imprison people pretrial, it's also um, sticky and a thorny problem that involves several different actors. And so I think, you know, the, the audience needs to understand that, you know, it's n that's not one of these things that the DA just says by fiat, um, we're going to have cash bail in this case or we're not. A the, the DA makes a recommendation and then the judge has to actually impose it or not impose it. Um, and so I think one, you know, to be a little bit critical of, of Krasner's decision to make cash bail his, his opening salvo, right? When he knew he didn't have the power to eliminate it unilaterally, it shows now because he still hasn't eliminated it, right? Because he doesn't have the power to eliminate it. Um, and so I think that that is, um, a political reality that he is dealing with now. Now, is he still better on cash bail than 99% of prosecutors out there? Of course, but um, it, it's one thing to describe how horrible it is and it's another thing to fix it. And it's gonna take a little longer to actually fix it, including legislative. Yeah. And because, sorry, sorry to tag onto this, but I think we haven't figured out what it means to replace cash bail with something else. And so that's a problem that is kind of percolating out there because we had this movement and this big advocacy movement that talked about like we're going to get rid of cash bail but that can mean a lot of things right they did that in Maryland and pretrial detention went up um like the DC system is no panacea um you know they got rid of pretrial uh, or cash bail for a lot of misdemeanors in Houston I look at that jail population list almost every week and they're just upcharging cases now right and they're enhancing everything so that they fall into the felony category so cash bail turns out to be yes we should get rid of it because it's stupid and it just makes rich people richer but figuring out what it gets replaced with is, com is com very, very complicated and we've acted like it's not. And I think that's to our peril. So it makes it a harder issue for the DA to talk about, you know, the defender to figure out what to talk about, for probation to figure out what to talk about, for judges to figure out what to talk about, because it's like what's next and what's next can be more dangerous. And so I think that, you know, that makes it much harder too. Yep. Well, um, at that, it is actually nine o'clock. Um, so believe it or not, we've already gone through an hour. Um, thank you each of you for joining me. I'm very grateful to you, the panelists, and also to our viewers for spending their time the evening with us. Don't forget to let us know what you thought of the episode by clicking on the doc scale link in the chat or texting justice to 415-223-8013. Please visit our website, clause40.org, to register for next week's episode and panel where former PDS lawyer Blair Brown and board member of Clause 40 Foundation will be moderating a discussion featuring Rebecca Brown from the Innocence Project, Lisa Wayne, who's past president of the NACDL, and more. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Yes. Thanks so Thank much. You. Awesome panel. Thanks, guys. Good to see Thank you all. You. Yep. Too. Congrats, Kira.